is no such a thing everybody is evil because evil destroys you. You have to make peace with yourself. Ernie Light has more reasons than most to feel the world is evil. He survived Hungarian labor camps, a Nazi death march, the infamous killing center Auschwitz, and the Dachau concentration camp. He saw most of his family killed by the Nazis. But Ernie values life. He was born on July 9th, 1920, in eastern Czechoslovakia. I came from a large family, of a family of 10 children. I was the youngest in the family. My father was 50 when I was born, and my oldest brother was 25. Somehow we managed. We were not rich but we were not poor either. We had a lot of land, but no cash. That was the fate of most of Czechoslovakia's Jews. They were among the poorest Jews in all of Europe and were coping with the effects of a worldwide depression in the 1930s. Czechoslovakia was cobbled together at the end of World War I from territories of several adjacent countries. When Hitler came to power, he demanded that the part of Czechoslovakia that was home to a large population of ethnic Germans be annexed back to Germany. In 1938, under the Munich Pact, the area known as the Sudetenland was given back to Germany to appease Hitler and stop a possible European war. Ernie's part of Czechoslovakia, Subcarpathia Rus, was taken by Hungary which was then allied with Germany in March 1939. In 1941, Irish military age, I was supposed to go into the Hungarian army. I went through my physical, I passed it, and in October, I was supposed to go into the army. Hungary inducted Jews into their army, but they were kept apart from the Christian units. He became so-called labor units. We didn't have any kind of military equipment, but they wanted us to, to experience some of the basic training feelings. For the next two years, Ernie and his labor unit were sent all over Hungary, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. They repaired barracks in the Hungarian mountains and built roads outside Transylvania. Eventually, Ernie ended up in Yugoslavia at one of the largest copper mines in Europe. There, he encountered Germans who were not hostile to Jewish laborers. We had one of them who was exceptional, even I remember his name. His name was Saunders. When we worked night shifts, he used to take and build a fire. And at lunchtime, he went back to his barracks for lunch. And we stayed there. When he came back, he brought us some leftovers or anything we want to and said, here, I'll be watching. And he said, you go to sleep for a while. But he was an unusual human being. In January 1944, Ernie suffered a serious injury that changed everything. We were removing a retaining wall and they had a very mild winter there. And suddenly the wall let go and about 10 or 12 of us were injured. That's when I had a broken leg, a broken arm, and of course no hospital, no doctors. They had an infirmary, and we stayed there for a while. Ernie wound up in a military hospital in a separate unit for the Jewish soldiers. Conditions were still decent for Jews. His family was allowed to visit him, and when he was well enough, he was transferred to Yugoslavia and then discharged from the army. But then, March arrived, and with it, the dissolution of the partnership between Germany and Hungary. The Jews, who had been relatively protected before by the Hungarians, were now at risk. April 8th, yeah, was the first day of Pesach, and then right the day after Pesach came an announcement all the Jews 
pack up your belongings and with that your maximum is 50 kilos per family that's 100 pounds or so we wound up an abandoned brickyard factory we arrived they didn't have the even where to pull us and we slept outside because most men Ernie's age were either in the Hungarian army or labor camps, he was one of a small number of young, healthy men. The rest gathered at the station were either the old or very young. After about a month, the Jews were told to gather their belongings. The Hungarian soldiers told us to unpack what you have. They wanted to make sure that nothing valuable was being taken out of the country. And I had a very nice leather coat and the soldier tells me, he says, give me that coat. He says, I can't. I'll need it where I am going. He says, where you are going, you will need it. And that was the first time that I realized there is something wrong. And we got on a kettle car, squeezed in, thrown together, young, old, it didn't make any difference. The train was headed straight to Auschwitz. And we get out of the train, and it says, raus, raus, schnell, schnell, out, out, fast, fast. And we got out and looked around, and I see these people in striped uniforms. The orders came, women on one side, men on another side, and then came the selection. All the able-bodied people were sent on one side, all the older people, and these people are children on the other side. I came into the barracks after the selections. There were people who came before we did, and I started to talk to them. I says, you know, I came here last night. I came an extended family, a large family. All of these people, says, were there older people? Yes. He says, and I, I, I saw it. Says, we see the flames, you smell the stench, that's where they are. And I thought to myself, this is impossible, it's 20th century. The Jews from Hungary were coming by the thousands every day. Most were gassed immediately. But those, like Ernie, who were selected to live, were put to work. A few days after his arrival in Auschwitz, he was sent to Warsaw, 300 miles away. The Warsaw Ghetto uprising happened a year earlier. It was mostly destroyed, and our job was to go into the ghetto to salvage anything that's worthwhile, copper pipes and all these things, and to load it on freight cars after that and taking back to Germany. Ernie's luck held, and he was soon picked for lighter duty, doing maintenance at the nearby SS headquarters but every other week they still had selections, and the weak were sent back to Auschwitz to be killed. By the end of July, the Jews could hear the Russians moving closer. The Germans evacuated, taking the prisoners on a death march west. July the 28, 29, something like that. And we walked 80 kilometers, hot, impossibly hot, no water. So finally, finally, we arrived at the river, there was a bridge, the SS set up their scent, just like that, with the guns, with machine guns, and suddenly came the same voice, rouse, rouse, schnell, schnell. And those people who didn't make it fast, suddenly you saw a Red River, they just mowed them down. Then they squeezed the surviving prisoners on trains. The train started to move, and the suddenly it got very hot. By the evening and afternoon, very thirsty, the night came. A lot of us who 
Colusa made it. The second day already, it was a little bit easier because quite a few people died during the night and we lined them up in the ends like that. So there was more room for those people who are still living. The third day we pulled up and the train stopped. We came out and we found out we are in Dachau. For the next six months, Ernie worked in several different labor camps. In January 1945, he fell ill with typhus. He survived, and by April, things again changed. By April, you could see the Allied Air Force was flying freely. And I think 9th of June, or the 10th of June of 1945, we were shooting. In the morning, we woke up, and there were nurses medics, all kinds of things like that. The shooting was celebration, the V-Day. Ernie found out after the war that four of the six brothers survived. Only one sister lived. She had come to Pittsburgh in the 1920s. Everybody else from his large extended family was gone. I wanted to live. That was the most important thing. The minute you said I had enough, I don't want to live, and within a few days, they all were dead. I was never selected in camp to be anything over somebody to, to in charge or anything like that. I have done nothing wrong, and I am free of any guilt. And that is my basic thing. I, I, it's, it's very difficult to make peace with yourself. If you can't make peace with yourself, you'll live a much happier life.